not till tomorrow morning no good evening friends i need hardly say that i'm delighted to be here with you after what i've heard about this program and after what i know about the quality of work that anuradha and her colleagues do in 9.9 because i think in some sense what she and her colleagues do to identify talent to identify performers to identify those with the kind of potential that will deliver this country to where it legitimately belongs i think that is truly inspirational that is truly exemplary and therefore when i get invited to events like these i do make it a point to say yes the last two occasions i have explained to her but somewhere i think she hasn't forgiven me i i was physically unable to make it to the place where the event was held and that is why i wasn't with the cfo community at that point of time there's another reason why i'm happy to be here during award season the award season is like convention season it starts somewhere in end october and goes on to i think mid february the weather is good people generally feel nice except those that get under the weather and uh, oh you say good things about one another you give away awards most of the awards are given to people who've been there done that to put it positively or how to put it bluntly are past their sell by date uh, they are the ones that get most awards those that are even more past their sell by date are the guys that give away the awards and i have been privileged to be on both sides of this transaction in recent times it's like what shakespeare said long ago about the quality of mercy it blesses him that gives and him that receives so you feel privileged when you give an award you feel privileged when you receive an award but it's rarely that you get fora like these where you identify people who are going to do big things tomorrow and who are identified on the basis of what they have done until now what promise they hold and whose selection is being made by people who know what the business is about who have the knack of identifying potential and who have what it takes to tell the grain from the chaff i think that is hugely important to be judged by people who know what they are judging is itself a very rare thing in this country today why this country go outside look at what happened to obama in year 1 of the presidency he was given the nobel prize for peace and what he did in the subsequent years for peace i am not taking a political position you and i know very well so they gave the award first hoping that thereafter he would deliver on peace but i think you people who are award winners now who are the cfos uh, in the making in a sense are not the people who came in from the cold have been recognized and will thereafter try and measure up to why you have been recognized what you are expected to do you already have something under your belt you are raring to go the higher positions are there for the asking and that is when if i may make a gender specific statement only to be absolutely clear that is when you will tell the men apart from the boys i said that once and i had a friend a lady in the auditorium when i was speaking who looked at me somewhat quizzically and therefore i added in the same breath women in any case are always winners it's only the men that you have to tell who the men are apart from the boys right so people that at some stage in life having some achievements have been identified by people who know what they ought to know to be the stars of tomorrow i believe there is no better recognition than this and even if you do the best that you can going forward all that you will do is to measure up to the faith and the trust and the confidence that your seniors in your profession in your chosen way of life have chosen to bestow on you it's a huge ask 
it's one way you can believe that having been thus recognized you can now sit back and bask in glory if that is done you will let yourself down it's happened to several of us get recognized too early then sit back and think that uh, there's nothing more to prove to anyone and then you hurt yourself in the process but also hurt those that repose faith and trust in you that is not something that any of us would want to happen to ourselves or to our colleagues anuradha mentioned as i came in i heard her mention something about professionalism and integrity i think these two words are bandied in almost every context that the real meaning of these two words is lost upon most of us what is professionalism i think it's important in these challenging times to ask yourself what is professionalism to my mind professionalism is very simple professionalism is like what murli vijay did a couple of days ago and i believe some of you do get up early in the morning to watch cricket live on australian television what did he do he left the balls that needed to be left outside the stumps he didn't fiddle around with any of them he played the ones that were in danger of rattling his stumps and he just stood there did what he knew was right did what he knew was in the interest of the team to the extent that when he actually scored 100 runs and i haven't heard this anywhere before that a batsman at any level of the game from school cricket to test cricket scores 100 runs and then has his partner walk across to him a tap him on the shoulder and say have you seen the scoreboard you've scored 100 runs which is when he takes off his helmet and acknowledges the cheers of the audience that deeply immersed in the cause that he was serving in the cause that he had taken to serve excluding personal recognition excluding the understanding that personal milestones were around the corner that to my mind defines professionalism more than anything else it is about the ability to extract value that is in public good it is about taking from any situation what is good in that situation and leaving out what is not good and let me give you the example that i am most fond of giving mahatma gandhi before india became independent unfortunately he didn't live too long after india became independent but before a few years before independence got a letter signed by some gentleman who was clearly completely off his rocker it was full of abuse invective call it what you will personal attacks on the mahatma if memory serves me right around 14 pages written in fairly close lines hand written so mahatma gandhi read that letter without any expression on his face and sitting opposite him was pandit nehru who as you and i know was a fair complexioned man who was not known for equanimity whatever else he might have been known for and who on being shown the letter turned beetroot red and he told the mahatma this is complete nonsense you should take action against the person who wrote this letter what the mahatma did was very interesting and i think in that small example there is a great story for all of us those days there were no staplers staplers came much later there were only if some of you recall the i don't know how many of you old enough to recall there was a time when we used pins to affix papers to one another before the staplers came so gandhi ji removed the pin which held together these 14 sheets of paper put that in the old pin cushions that we used to have in our earlier days in our office he put that there took the rest of the letter and put it in the waste paper basket and a furious nehru said why are you doing this we need to figure this out we need to fix this chap gandhi ji's response was look jawahar i have extracted the only thing of value from that letter 
The rest of it has no value for me. This pin I can put to use on a future date. So he extracted the pin, kept it there through that. In every situation, there is something positive. It is sheer professionalism that makes you look for it. Long years ago, in the Reader's Digest, which became unfashionable to mention, and thereafter again has gained a kind of a second life now, it is seen in bookshops, it disappeared briefly and has come back. There used to be a mention in the quotable quotes, which I am very fond of, which said, no person is entirely useless. The worst of them can serve as a horrible example. So you must see even that merit in a person, in a situation, in a context, to see what is it I can take out of here. That is going to serve not my personal use, but the use of that society, that community, that entity to which I belong, of which I am privileged to belong to. If that informs our thought, our word, our deed, I think you don't need any further proof of your professionalism. I must also tell you in a lighter vein, when the true meaning of professionalism came to me, after I was appointed chairman of the Unit Trust of India, with absolutely no background of finance, and I'll tell you in a minute what my qualifications were before I went in, but let me get to the story straight away. I was asked by a reporter, how is it that a non-professional like you has been chosen to head the organization? I didn't give him the honest answer, which is that all so-called professionals had run away, leaving only the innocent and the ignorant behind. So one of them thing was picked up and given this job. I didn't tell him that. But I made one request to him. I said, call me non-professional for the rest of your life. So long as you don't call me unprofessional, I will live with it. Non-professional, I am willing to live with. And then I discovered that there was nothing called... Professionalism is not about understanding what the nature of your job is. I am one of those who campaigns day in and day out that when putting people in boardrooms, Look for people with domain knowledge, domain familiarity. Don't look for people with domain expertise, because domain expertise can be counterproductive. Domain expertise will lead to situations where you have somebody peeping over the CEO's shoulder on a continuing basis and saying, you know, when I used to run the company, it used to be run better than this, or we used to do it differently, which you don't want in a good company. So I don't think professionalism about is about any of that. It is about doing what you believe is right because values are eternal. Values don't go away. Everything else might change. No, no country, no century redefines values. Values are eternal. They are consistent. They are non-negotiable. And if you play with that in mind, you will win every game there is to win. Sometimes you hear people saying, and there are books written on the subject, which says, good guys finish last, or good guys finish second. Yeah, sometimes good guys finish last. Sometimes good guys finish second or third. But that happens when you're running the 100 meters. Life is not 100 meters. When you run the marathon of life, the good guys don't finish last. Because some of the guys that took the shortcuts, that abandoned the highway and took the bylanes of expediency, you will find some of those guys hurt as you in your own slow, methodical manner overtake them. The story of the hare and the tortoise should not be lost on us. It is a real story and you see evidence of it every time around you. And the other thought that I wanted to share with you, taking off from what Anuradha said, is about integrity. What is integrity? Integrity is not financial integrity alone. Integrity is not intellectual integrity alone. 
Integrity is not about keeping your hands outside the till when you have an opportunity to put it into the till. That's a very, very limited view of integrity. Integrity is creating an environment in which each person that works with you believes and practices the virtue of doing what is right. Because you must be also an enabler. Being in personally a subscriber to integrity is not good enough as we have seen in this country. You can practice the virtue of honesty and close your eyes while there are people committing daylight robbery around you. Is that integrity? In my book, I'm sorry, it doesn't measure up. Whoever the person might be. Integrity is about creating that system, that ecosystem in which you have to do what is right. Where people will recognize even as they step out of line, that if you do something slightly wrong, somewhere you are going to pay the price for it. And that price is not necessarily an external price. It is a price of several sleepless nights. It's a price of being uncomfortable when you look into the mirror and see the person looking at you from the mirror and not being able to look back into the eyes of that person because you think you've done something wrong. That is integrity. So I think, you know, like everything else that she does, Anuradha was bang on target when she suggested that these are the two virtues that young persons aspiring to be group CFOs sooner rather than later should keep in their kit bag as they negotiate all the tasks ahead of them, all the pitfalls ahead of them, all the obstacles, the hurdles. Just look at what has happened to the CFO community over the years. Long years ago, not so long ago, but certainly Looking at the age group to which some of you belong in this audience, it seems so long ago. Long years ago, there used to be a company called Enron. Some of you might remember that, yes. When the then chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission of New York wanted to introduce a change in the accounting principles, that listed entities should subscribe to. He sent out a mail, it was a consultative process saying, this is what we propose to introduce. One of the earliest responses that he received was from the Enron CEO who said, we have a great board of directors, we have great external advisors, we have top class auditors, we have great professionalism. We have checks and balances that are exemplary. We do everything right. Why do you need to subject us to one more procedural or substantive requirement, whichever way you look at it? This was seven months before Enron exploded. Only seven months before. And if it interests you and if you have the time, look at the code of conduct that Enron employees were expected to sign before they joined Enron. If you show me a better code of conduct, better both in drafting and in content, I will take back every word that I have said until now. Arguably the best drafted code of conduct has certainly been my privilege to see. If you have seen better ones, do mention them to me. And yet what went wrong? Every principle was smartly buried, ignored, sidestepped and you created instruments, you created concepts, you created accounting shortcuts that led you to where you were and dishonesty of the highest order where you were as senior executives playing around with the shares of the company while your employees' fortunes in the 401k were going down because of the way you were operating the company. So it's not about what is written. Even in India, you will see several codes of conduct that are written. And part of the problem at that time was the CFO community. 
If the CFO community had measured up, had stood up and said, sorry, we will not be a part of all of this, perhaps, I'm only saying perhaps because one never knows, 2008 might not have been as bad a year as it was. Because all of what happened in 2008, whether it was Merrill, whether it was Lehman, whether it was Bear, whether it was Northern Rock in England, whatever it was, was because the conscience keepers of the system, the defenders of the faith as I call them, the CFOs, chose to either turn a blind eye or colluded in the process of undermining accounting principles and practices. That's not a luxury that a country like India can afford. We've seen in India a very major corporate scandal where people just looked away while the promoters were running away with the money. And then said, no, we didn't know, we weren't told. And I must tell you this too. After Enron happened, some three or four years later, I was privileged to run into one of the former directors of Enron at one of the airports in the US. So I caught hold of this man because I was curious. I wanted to know what happened. This was a highly qualified professional in the United States. So I asked him, how did this happen with people like you on the board? He said, we weren't told. My next question to him was, but did you ask? On the basis of what you got to know, did you ask the right questions? I haven't got my answer yet because God intervened in his favor. Even as I asked him that, somebody came and took him away. So I'm still waiting for my answer. I haven't got that. Please ask the right questions at the right time. If you pull your punches, if you don't ask the right questions, sooner rather than later, you are a part of the problem. What is worse is that the world outside looks at you as a part of the solution. They think you are the people who ensure that the numbers tell the right story, that the business strategy is consistent with the interests of the company. You are to put it in an aviation corollary. You are the co-pilots in the corporate cockpit. You know, one of the principles of aviation is that the pilot and the co-pilot on an aircraft don't eat the same food either before the flight or during the flight. The reason being that if there's something wrong with that food, only one of the two will get a stomach infection. Then there would be at least one guy who is fit to fly that aircraft and land it safely. When you are the co-pilot in the corporate cockpit with a promoter pilot who is also in an executive role, remember that more often than not, and I don't mean to generalize, but it's useful to remember this, Call it the entrepreneurial spirit of the promoter. Call it the unabashed greed of the promoter. Call it what you will. Will often ensure that the kind of care and caution that you need is abandoned. And it is for you then to rein that person in. If I may give an analogy from a game of football which I am very fond of. The role of the CFO is something like the role of the intermediate line in a football team. Intermediate line in a football team ensures that the forwards get their passes. Where they need the ball, they get the ball. The supply is kept intact so that your CEOs who are in the front line score the goals that they can. They also step back to help the defense avert disaster. And on occasion, they move up and score the goal themselves if it is a strategic move, a merger or an acquisition. And the best football teams in the world are the ones that have had the strong intermediate lines. The Messi's and Ronaldo's of world football could not have been created 
but for the nameless faceless guys that are in the intermediate line spraying them with passes which they have no option but to convert to goals you are in that role you are in that god given role of holding this whole thing together i'll spend 2 minutes to tell you where this country is and why if you don't take advantage we would have lost it some of you know about a gentleman called navjot singh siddhu he used to play cricket for india once upon a time then became a commentator now mercifully he has given up cricket and moved on to humor whether the humor is in his being on the humor show or otherwise one doesn't know but he made one comment which was interesting he said when opportunity knocks at the door get up and open that door the job of opportunity is to knock your job is to get up and open that door if you don't open that door there are several other doors that it will go and knock at opportunity is knocking at india's door this is the time for persons who are qualified who are committed to the cause of the nation to stand up and deliver to measure up to their potential which is huge not to underperform on an individual or a collective basis and to ensure that this opportunity this window that we have is one that we utilize other countries are watching to see how india shapes up we have a new political dispensation i am not a political person so i am not making a political statement but every change represents opportunity every opportunity is a challenge in a sense because that exhorts you to deliver what you need to deliver i wish you well i know that a few years from now some of you would not only have become full fledged cfos but would be members of anuradha's selection panel to select the next 100 it's your job to see that the pipeline grows the pipeline is uncluttered the pipeline delivers more quality than it delivered every time the previous time good luck godspeed